Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for the kind introduction and pleasure to be here. Uh, I think it's already 1.15, so I'm going to be very, very quick. I want to make three points. One is uh, just sort of fantasize a bit on what 2030 could look like for renewables. It, the various estimates, so that's, that's point number one. Various estimates say that in 2030, India will need approximately 750 gigawatts of power generation, right? The numbers obviously go from 600 to 900, depending on whether you believe World Bank or McKinsey or Government of India's estimates, but let's say 750, just for fun. And if you assume that 20% of that comes from renewable energy, that's about 150 gigawatts of energy. In power generation terms, given that renewable only gives you about 25% PLF, that's equal to close to half a terawatt, 450, 500 gigawatts. So just by assuming 20%, you will recognize that India could have 500 gigawatts of renewables by 2030. At a dollar a watt, that's half a trillion dollars of money that needs to go into, some of which has already gone, but a lot still remains. That's a 20%. If you assume that we can do 50% because the technologies are very smart and India slowly and steadily learns tenth, a tenth of what Marcus was showing us today, we'll probably get to 50% because he shows that in July, you know, uh, the German grid was able to handle 79% in, in July, right? So even if you go to 50%, this can be more than a trillion dollars, 1.25 terawatts of renewable energy. So it's a massive opportunity. So I think all of us should congratulate uh, each other for being here in this room and wanting to work in this industry. The real, I mean, real challenges, obviously, Sunil, uh, Vinayth, and uh, Sumanth have all talked about. So I'm not going to touch upon that. But it is, it is a massive opportunity that uh, you know, we should all march towards. So that's point number one. Very, very exciting. Second, uh, second point I want to make is uh, there is a, if you look at what is the cost of electricity that goes to the irrigation sector for the government of India, in my estimate, it's between 100 and 150 billion dollars. I'll tell you why. My numbers are not going to be accurate. So I'm not a statistician and. Uh, uh, Dr. Agnihotri, I think, did a great job with the analysis, so I'm just going to be more broad level. But apparently the Indian government spends about $10, $12 billion a year on subsidizing electricity for irrigation pumps. And this has been, there, this has been going on forever, and no political leader can afford to uh, distance the farmers who depend on this by shutting off this free electricity. So it's going to continue, if I were to assume, forever. So how do we, if I were to give it a multiple of 10, because it goes on for a, while, uh, for a while and you did an NPV of that, it's going to come to 100 plus $150 billion. So for me, this is a $150 billion problem as well as an opportunity. The farmers are not happy at all because they get electricity in the middle of the night. We have visited houses of thousands of farmers where the farmer has died because of snake bites having to do it in the middle of the night. Because it's unpredictable electricity, he's using flood irrigation and only some crops can deal with Un uncertain amount of water. So all of this really farmers are not happy and at any given time in any state there is half a million to a million farmers that are waiting in line to get free connection but the government doesn't want to give because it's more subsidy and more problem for the each of the governments, right? So it's a huge issue. From a gigawatt perspective it's 25 million pumps. If you assume 5 horsepower which is equivalent to let's say 5 kilowatts it's 125 gigawatt of opportunity. You give it a dollar it's 125 billion dollar opportunity to replace this 150, 100 250 billion dollar problem which exists. So economics can work. And the other point, you know, many of my colleagues have said already, solar and wind are already the cheapest. I think you give it one or two more years, it'll get to coal parity in generation terms. So it's not an issue, it's not an issue of economics at all and this can really work. Now, so what we are proposing is, we, you know, we've been trying to, we've done a few thousand installations of irrigation pumps. It really works very well. Farmers are happy, they migrate to more higher value added crops. You give them daytime jobs as opposed to going in the middle of the night. The problem is irrigation pumps are not utilized 300, 350 days in a year. He doesn't need water all these days. So how, what do you do with this capital asset which will not be utilized fully? You connect it back to the grid that, does, that did not supply energy to him before. It probably supplied four hours a day. It essentially becomes a power generation source when he's not pumping water. Feed electricity. When you feed electricity, you can give him a power purchase agreement from the DISCOM. Now the DISCOM, in some states, 20 to 25% of the state's electricity go for irrigation pumping. Now suddenly that you don't need to account for that. You can divert it to commercial and residential and other purposes and release that much amount of energy. Farmer can now feed electricity, you give him a PPA. Because he has a PPA, you can fund the project, maybe bring the unutilized priority sector money, which runs into 10, 20 billion dollars a year into this sector because farmer can be the borrower. 
and suddenly you've made it a financeable, bankable structure with farmer now having a new source of income and is happy with what he can do in the farm itself. So that's idea number two. We don't need to wait till 2030, but by 2030, I think we can make our 25 odd million farmers and another 25 million farmers that don't have free electricity very, very happy and fix the distribution utilities balance sheet and PL woes because this 10, 12 billion dollars essentially makes way into the PLs and accumulated losses of our discounts and structurally it's a huge problem as all of us know. Last idea, point number three. In our view, you know, the 400 odd million Indians that don't have electricity, don't have energy access, most of them, let's say pick a number, 75% of them have cell phone connections, which means within, within a reasonable distance there is a tower which is able to send them a signal. So the tower obviously out of the 400,000 towers, approximately 25% of them run predominantly on diesel. About 50,000 towers run only on diesel, but another 50,000 use eight hours or more of diesel. So there's a significant overlap out of these 400 million people that live within a tower that uses the diesel. All you need to do is set up a microgrid, power the tower companies. You have multiple tower companies giving you a power purchase agreement, which is then a bankable contract. You're able to go raise money from the industry. And all you need to do is start serving a la carte menu of services for the household, start display, displacing the kerosene that they spend, $3 a month. And maybe the ones that can pay more, you give them a light and a cell phone connection and then give them more, you know, you charge them 200 rupees. So this can be done. We, we have built close to 100 microgrids. It's working very well. We're expanding. We think without government subsidy, this model is scalable. And similarly, the irrigation pumping, which is $125 billion or 125 gigawatts or 25 million pumps, can also be done in a very economically viable way. We just need the right policymakers because it cuts across many different ministries and departments, all of them sitting together and recognizing that when we suggest something like this, it's not like I have something, an ulterior motive. It's just I think the numbers work, the concept works, and uh, just some food for thought. Thank you.